Uh, thanks everyone so much uh, for having me here today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some of the exciting integrations I've been working on with Ember 2.0 and Google's Polymer project. Uh, it might get a little weird in the beginning, uh, probably not as weird as that, but... Uh, <laughs> So the goal at the end of this is to empower you as a developer to give your uh, users experiences that they've never had before. So right now there's a lot of turmoil in the web landscape. It seems like the, the hate against the web has been ratcheted up to an all-time high level. I'm constantly hearing things like web views suck, the, the DOM is horribly slow and fundamentally flawed, JavaScript is flawed and doomed to failure, and uh, hybrid mobile apps are complete garbage. Uh, but once again, the, the web seems to be falling into this classic underdog narrative. But as we've all learned from popular culture, you never underestimate the underdog. For example, Oliver Twist triumphing over so many different obstacles. A rowdy team of sprinters from Jamaica making it to the Winter Olympics for bobsledding. And they didn't win, but it was still a pretty awesome movie. And then, of course, the greatest underdog story of all time, a classic in the eyes of history's greatest scholars. Baby from Dirty Dancing, and she finally nails the dramatic lift at the end of the show, because nobody puts Baby in a corner. But I'm a huge believer in the web. Uh, the web browser is the largest application runtime of the world and will just continue to grow. Every single device, no matter what it is, has to be connected to the web. Tablets, phones, TVs, cars, uh, smart appliances, Internet of Things. Are you going to be developing native applications for each different platform? As a user, I, I don't want to be watching TV, and when I want to do something, I, I need to download an app in order to do it. I just want to pop open a web browser and just handle it right there. And I honestly believe that web style engineering skill sets make way too much business sense and, in, and inevitably will prevail. And despite what the haters say, web performance is definitely on the rise. Web frameworks and toolkits are getting closer and closer to native performance every single day. This is in browsers and in native style mobile apps. There's still, there's still a ways to go, but uh, new advancements such as iOS's WK WebView and iOS 8's new rendering engines for HTML5 and JavaScript significantly increase performance. And things like web components, uh, native web components, and uh, the Web Animations API are offloading a lot of the heavy lifting onto the native browser code, freeing up your main JavaScript thread and also significantly increasing performance. And hybrid apps have a bad reputation, but if you use the right performant interlocking pieces, you can build delightful mobile apps with web tech. And yes, native applications can be incredibly fast, especially in the view layer, um, if you're doing heavy gaming or building complex custom behaviors. But what I'm most interested in is using the best, most productive tools for the job at hand. And the fact remains that web tools are starting to get really fucking awesome. Yeah, for the web. <laughs> so one of my core philosophies, one of the things that I, that I try to ask myself every day, is how can I, as one person with a laptop, leverage my time as powerfully as I possibly can every minute I dedicate to work? And this also goes for small teams or large companies that are broken up into smaller teams. How can you be as productive and effective as you possibly can with limited time and limited resources? How do you get the most bang for your buck? And for me, the answer is standing on the shoulders of giants. The way to be able to do truly extraordinary things with limited resources is to build off the work of brilliant people and help push shared solutions and community initiatives forward step by step. So I've taken the best of Ember, Polymer, and material design in order to do something I didn't really think was possible, uh, but I proved myself wrong one late night. So I'm here today to share with you what can come from a bottle of whiskey and, and a crazy idea. It's something that when I sit back and really think about it, it, it kind of makes me giddy, like, like Ron Swanson here. And it makes me feel like a little kid sitting in front of a Christmas tree about to unwrap a present on Christmas morning. So right now I'm, a calling, I'm calling this approach Ember Flow. And I really believe it's a paradigm shift for web interaction design. It's an animation approach that bridges the gap between application states, providing a sense of context and clarity of purpose as you move through an app experience. So I'll show you a quick video that shows off some of the apps that I've been working on with this approach recently.
Uh, <laughs> thank you. So yeah, so those are a few things I've been working on recently. Of, of course, set to dramatic pirate music for, for Mass Effect. Uh, so, so what did you just see? Um, what you just saw was an integration between Ember and Polymer to shift web app flows from jarring state-based click-pop, click-pop interactions to a continuous flow through an app with smooth navigation and no break in the user experience. So the user has a sense of context, focus, and clarity of purpose as they move through the app. It's almost like the concept of suspension of disbelief when you're watching a great movie. So an interesting thing happens when building an app with this approach and then taking out these interstate transitions. To me, it starts to feel like a broken experience. So I get the same feeling now when I go from a client rendered app to a server rendered app. The server rendered app starts to feel like a broken experience. So once you start adding in these kind of tasteful interstate transitions, it, it starts to get really tough to go back. So the goal really is to blur the lines between native and web to create such an immersive experience that you don't notice what's running what, what is web or what is native. Uh, so now let's dig into some of the tech that makes this possible. So web components. Why should I care about web components? What is the difference between an Ember component and a Polymer component, and when do I use each? And how can I use web components to be more productive as a developer at day to day? So with the web component spec, you're actually extending the browser itself, which if you think about it, is actually like pretty damn cool. Um, Polymer components actually extend a base component that acts as a convenience method, but we'll talk more about that later. So web components also give you encapsulation. So it creates a kind of a walled garden where no JavaScript or CSS can bleed in or out unless it's explicitly passed through. There's also this declarative nature of reading through an app and understanding the structural intent and what the developer was trying to do from just the markup itself. So you're defining your own HTML elements and you're hiding its internals, which also gives you this nice separation of concerns. It also, um, when implemented natively, gives you true reusability and portability across all apps and, and uh, different frameworks. So in terms of when to use Polymer and when to use Ember, or why I love them, Number one for Ember, developer productivity. As I talked about before, Ember allows me to leverage my time as powerfully as I possibly can. It also has amazing conventions and gives me a lot of happiness. And even though, of course, it pisses me off a lot of times, as I'm sure everybody in this room has at one point been pissed off by Ember, or Ember Data, or something along those lines, the developer ergonomics and Ember conventions are better than I've seen in any other framework. There's also a brilliant community, as evidenced by everybody here and around the world that's contributed to this project. There's so many smart people dedicating so many nights and weekends to this, it boggles my mind. Also, the world-class routing and state management. After a number of iterations, Ember finally nailed the router pattern, and we no longer have thousands of lines of code routers with all, every single possible leaf state defined. And I love Google's uh, Polymer material design projects for constantly pushing the web forward and bridging the gap between the browser APIs of tomorrow and being able to use them in, in production in your apps today. I also wanted to talk a little bit about the web animations API. It's something that a, a, a lot, not a lot of people are actually like, talking about or using that much, but it combines uh, the best of both worlds of CSS and JavaScript animations. Um, Chrome actually uses the same rendering engine to render CSS animations as web animations. And web animations run outside the main thread, so they're accelerated by the GPU, which frees up your main JavaScript thread for all your application functions. There's also things like motion paths, uh, animation grouping, and more granular control, which I'm not really gonna go into today. Uh, you could have a whole talk of your own on that one, but it's really exciting stuff, and you should definitely check it out. So now we're gonna demo a, a super basic example of Ember and Polymer binding to the same property value. So first, let's define our, our Polymer component. Um, on the first line, we define the component name, which is pulsing circle, and the attributes, uh, color, and duration. So then we define the template. Uh, first, our CSS styles, and if you look at the background color property, um, it's actually a, a familiar look. It's the, the double mustache curly braces that HTML bars and handlebars use. And then we have our markup, which is uh, super simple, just uh, div class equals circle, and it's styled above. Um, and in the ready section, or below, it starts to kind of look like uh, 
like the, the JavaScript version of Ember components um, inside the Polymer block. So we have uh, duration set to a default value of 2200, and we have the ready block, which is very similar to did insert element. Um, so then we set a default color of blue with this dot color. We grab the circle in the shadow DOM with this dot shadow root query selector for circle. Um, and then this is uh, how we use the web animations API. Once we have that, we have circle dot animate, and uh, we're taking the opacity from one down to zero, while at the same time transforming the scale from zero up to four times its original size, which is in this case 400 by 400. So it's basically fading out and growing at the same time. Um, and then we set down below duration to uh, the duration defined above. Um, we throw in a little bit of easing to kind of make it pulse and give it a nice feel. Um, and then we set iterations to infinity so it's just constantly looping. So the now the, the most basic uh, Ember thing that I could come up with was a, a simple Ember input box, bound, the value bound to circle color. And then we instantiate our Polymer component, which is pulsing circle. We set color equal to the same, uh, the same value, which is circle color. So now with two lines of code, um, if you see, as, as, we, as we type in different colors, it basically live changes the color of that pulsing circle. So the data is flowing from Ember, the Ember bound attribute, um, down into the Polymer component, and then it's changing that uh, background color style. And this is all happening in real time. All right, so for our next demo, we're gonna ramp it up a little bit and play around with uh, Polymer's core animated pages component. Another thing that it just kind of blows my mind that not many people are, are kind of talking about this or using it that much. Um, so in this case, we're gonna take an image and break it up into two different states. Uh, one is a small version of the image aligned flush left uh, against the screen, and the next version is double the size, pushed over about 300 pixels to the right. And so using core animated pages, we're gonna move from, from the one state of the image into the next, and core animated pages will handle this animation, and one image will morph into the other one. And just by setting a single attribute, uh, a single value, it will handle that dynamic uh, transition and animation for us. So uh, first we set up our markup. So we have a core animated pages uh, container component with the hero transition, of, uh, hero transition and crossfade transitions defined. We also have a selected attribute that we're gonna set with HTML bars bound properties. And the core animated pages component requires its child elements to be wrapped in section tags, as you can see. Um, so, this, and then it, core animated pages, whatever section tags are its child elements, um, it will select whichever view is active based on that selected attribute, which is the, the child index view. And then so now for a little bit of magic, as you see, um, so inside the section tags, we have a div of hero one and hero two. We set a hero ID to pick, and you see, you see there's the same hero ID in both. So when we set the hero ID, it informs Polymer, or informs uh, core animated pages what we're doing the, the um, hero transition on. All right, so we set a little bit of CSS. We're just setting one thing, 300 by 200 pixels, um, and just making it flush left. Uh, the next image is double the size, pushed over to the right. And then we just have a, a couple simple Ember button components, um, and all they're doing is setting a, a selected value to zero or one. So then as we see, when we click this, it, it smoothly animates from one state into the next state just by hitting, so, so what's happening, uh, Ember is setting that value, the selected value, to zero or one. It's going into core animated pages. Core animated pages is then selecting the correct child element, and, uh, and then it's core animated pages itself is taking care of the entire tweening uh, transformation for us. So this is, this is actually pretty cool. So for demo number three, we're gonna build off what we just did in our last demo and apply it to Ember route transitions. So I'm not gonna go over all the code because we have limited time, uh, but I've open sourced a demo app that you can see up on uh, github.com slash belangslet, and it has all these, these techniques uh, working, and, and I'll demo the app in a little bit, but um, you can go on there and, and play around with the code. So this is a little bit of a mind melter, but um, so we're defining a Polymer outlet, 
a Polymer Outlet's a helper that injects a container view into handle the child views that are plugged into it. And behind the scenes, we override certain features of Ember's routing functionality in order to, to delay the destruction of the outgoing view until a core animated page's uh, completed callback fires. So we're setting up our routes below, below that, as you can see. And um, kind of a, a little hacky type thing, as I said before, core animated pages needs its child elements to be wrapped in section tags. So here we're defining each view that corresponds to a route, um, and we're setting the tag name equal to the section, or equal to section. And so this, this might be a little hard to see the code, but this is, uh, this is uh, one of the card components. Um, so here, um, which, yeah, might be a little bit hard to see, but you can see if you, you check it out online. Um, I'm defining a dynamic hero ID with HTML bars that is bound to the unique ID of the model that has been passed into it. So what's really cool is now once this is all set up, all I have to do is define a hero ID on whatever elements that I want to uh, morph into a different element in one component and do it in the next component, and it will magically take care of this animation for us. So now I'm gonna do something really stupid and try to demo this on an iPad. So bear with me for a little bit as I get this up and running. So this is actually a, um, let's see here. So this is an Ember CLI Cordova application um, that uses uh, iOS's WK WebView. So this is all Ember and Polymer, um, and there are no optimizations, there's no anything. Um, so we're gonna see if this actually works. All right, so, so this is on an iPad. And we're kind of going back and forth. As you can see, it's pretty damn smooth. So for a lot of the, the kind of haters saying that you can't get the same type of, of performance out of Ember or in Polymer on, uh, in, and Cordova, which the code base isn't actually that, that good anyway, but so there's, there's lots of rooms for optimization in this. But yeah, so if anyone has a favorite Parks and Rec character, we can call this out real quick. Looks like April is uh, island hopping in Thailand, which is always fun. But anyway, you can see there are really smooth animations back and forth running native style on an iPad um, using web technology with no optimization. So you could definitely increase the performance, but... So thankfully that worked. <laughs> so now I gotta get back to the slides here. Um, oh, that was wrong. Oh no, there we go. Okay, cool. Um, so like I said, uh, this is a work in progress and um, I actually just pushed it up last night at like three in the morning. So I, I wanted to do a lot more fun things with it, but I just kind of ran out of time. Um, so it, it runs great on iOS right now. Um, it's strangely, and it runs great on Safari where it's going through a polyfill because Safari doesn't actually support these type of animations yet. Um, but these are actually supposed to run native on Chrome, but Chrome is really glitchy for some strange reason. So if anybody's on the, the, the Chrome core team or the Polymer team, uh, I, I have a couple questions for you and would love to talk with you. So, and yeah, I'm not gonna dig too deep into the code right now as I said, but it is up online um, and you can check it out. So kind of back to like, what is, what is the dream stack? At least for me, it's Ember for routing, high level architecture, and translating user intent into meaningful state manipulation and, and data persistence. I really love the, uh, the Polymer layout grid. So this is something else not a lot of people are talking about. Um, it's built on Flexbox, has a really concise declarative structure, and um, this, is, this alone I think is, is worth using Polymer for. And I love Ember components and Polymer components, usually using Ember components for more complex data structures and Polymer components for specific small markup things or to give functionality that, uh, that Ember components don't give, like for example, this core animated pages um, uh, component that comes with Polymer. And Polymer is great because it gives all these, all these different uh, wonderful polyfills and, and they work really hard on these. These are very difficult engineering problems. So things like shadow DOM, certain templating, uh, components with true encapsulation, 
um, the Web Animations API, and they basically allow you to use tomorrow's uh, technology in production today. So Ember going forward, what, what I kind of see it as, the, the continuing evolution of Ember allows you to build web apps with tomorrow's bleeding edge technology today. And it doesn't lock you into its own ecosystem, but more and more, especially with HTML bars, it allows you to take advantage of innovations in other frameworks and ecosystems and provides the most powerful, insane way to glue everything together. And I'm gonna kind of end on uh, this concept of community. So um, last year I showed up, it was actually my first tech conference ever. Um, I showed up here, didn't know a single person, um, was really kind of nervous, thought everyone would like, not like me and think I was stupid. Um, but I showed up and, and it was an incredible community. Um, here, here's a, a tweet from uh, Casper, who I don't believe is here this year, but this was uh, 25th of March, 2014. Um, and we were sitting there like having drinks and uh, late at night we had met a, a lot of great people. And it was, it was just an incredible experience for me to, to come to a first tech conference, meet so many amazing people, and it really kind of blew away my expectations. And then the fact that I'm here a year later on stage is, is a testament to how awesome this community is. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to you know, thank everyone out there for that. So yeah, with community, I, you know, just a couple of the, the, the thoughts. Um, so like, what are the people that you've met in these last couple of days, the relationships that you've built that, that can change the course of your life as it, as it has my life? And what are the ideas that'll change the way you think about yourself, your own capabilities, and the community momentum around you? And we've seen so many incredible things here at EmberConf, and I really hope that we take some amazing things from this, and, uh, and especially these amazing relationships as we go forward. So it looks like I have a little bit more time, so um, I might just play a demo with pirate music again. All right. So I'd just really like to say thank you to everybody for putting on this event, uh, the whole Ember core team for all the hard work that you guys do, everybody here today and around the world that's contributed to this project. Um, it's, a, it's a really amazing event. And um, also, um, so I'm B. Langslet, uh, like I said, the code for the, the iPad demo um, that also works in the browser, uh, not Chrome, <laughs> but Safari, um, is up on github.com slash B. Langslet. Hopefully someone can fix the Chrome stuff. Um, also. I'm at uh, Sign with Envoy. Um, if anybody wants to work with bleeding edge technology like this, uh, we're hiring and uh, we would love to work with you. We'd love to see uh, whatever ideas we, you guys would like to bring. So just come up to me and talk to me if, if you want to talk about this or anything else. So thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>